but also, of course, raised serious questions about the future of the energy transition, and at the same point, called into question policy and investment. I think that these folks on this panel had a front row seat, not just as policymakers, but as industry insiders as well, to what's happened over the last 12 months. They also have decades of experience when it comes to the energy industry, and they will be responsible in many ways for what happens next. I want to welcome my panelists, Prime Minister Mark Ruta, the President of Tanzania as well, Samia Hassan. Welcome, Madam President. Um, the Senator from West Virginia, Mr. Joe Manchin, Francesco Sirachi, the Chief Executive Officer and General Manager of Enel, as well as Elam Kadri, the CEO and Chairman of the Executive Committee of Solvay, and Keir Starmer, Leader of the Opposition of the United Kingdom. It seems like a good place to kick it off, because when we think about what's been happening across the world, energy poverty today is a major, major problem in the United Kingdom. Some 6.7 million people are having trouble making ends meet. According to the polls, Mr. Starmer, you could very well be the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. What is the plan? Uh, well, look, you're absolutely right. At the moment, the central focus is on the cost of living and the energy price, because we all know what's happened. 2022 was quite an extraordinary year. And what's happened in the UK is a short-term response to that. So we have capped frozen energy bills for the vast majority of people across the country. And we've funded that with a form of windfall tax on oil and gas companies, particularly in the North Sea. But that is only a short-term solution. It's a, what I call sticking plaster solution. What we need uh, is a strategy um, for renewables that binds together the challenge of high bills, um, energy security, so that we're not so exposed globally to Putin um, or whatever, the next generation of jobs that will come as we rush towards renewables, and, and our obligations in relation to um, the climate um, crisis. And that requires all countries, including my own, to show global leadership um, in this, to bring um, countries together. We've seen some examples of that. You see what's going on in America, see the early evidence of what's going on in Europe. We need that in the UK as well, and that's why at our, uh, at our party conference in the autumn of last year, we set our plans for what we call our Green Prosperity Plan, um, going towards clean power generation by 2030. Um, and that's ambitious. That means and here in Davos has been an opportunity for me to speak to many CEOs of uh, businesses and investors who would partner us if we're in government to do that. But it also re requires um, global leadership. And um, one of the things that uh, I am proposing is a clean power alliance where countries that are um, in the advance when it comes to net zero share um, information, cooperate, um, and share investment with a view to driving the global prices down. So this is an inverse OPEC, if you like. Um, instead of trying to you know, ensure prices stay at a certain level, it's to drive them down to see the common benefit, whether it's in the UK or across the globe. And um, if we could get that alliance working together, then I think um, that will be a big step in the right direction. Well, speaking of OPEC, yesterday on CNBC, I spoke exclusively with Ahmed Nasser, the CEO of Saudi Aramco. And one of the things that he told me was that he wasn't so worried about 2023, but he's much more worried about the medium to long term when it comes to spare capacity in the oil markets. And just to clarify for our viewers, are you prepared to encourage investment in oil and gas as well as renewables? What we've said about oil and gas is there does need to be a transition. Obviously, it will play its part during that transition, but not new investment, not new fields up in the North Sea, because we need to um, go towards uh, net zero. We need to um, ensure that renewable energy is where we go next. There's huge potential for this in the UK in terms of wind and offshore wind. We're already um, <coughs> developing that, that speed. We need onshore wind to go with it so that um, we have a combination that, as I say, brings the prices down, um, gets us off 
the international reliance on oil and gas. Um, and with it, gives us the next generation of jobs and deals with the climate crisis. And we, that's why we set a stretch target of 2030 for clean power generation. That's where we want to get to. So, yes, um, a role for oil and gas as we transition, but no to new investment because we've got to take this decision. And that's going to require leadership. So no new oil investment or gas investment in the North Sea? Yes. I want to pick up on something we heard yesterday from the former Vice President of the United States, Al Gore. He was talking about climate change, and he made some pretty strong statements. He talked about boiling oceans and rain bombs. Senator Manchin, when you hear that kind of rhetoric, do you believe that that is helpful to the conversation? Well, it's not, it's not factual. It's not basically real, realistic to what's, what's going on in the world right now. Let me just say that there's been a lot of consternation and concerns about the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, thinking that it's going to harm the EU. There is no intent whatsoever to harm any of our allies and, and basically to be able to uh, give them the assurance that we're always going to be there. Well, we've been blessed in the United States. We have the resources. We have oil. We have natural gas. We have the ability from technology to do everything we can to promote the new technologies of the future. What we're not going to do in the United States is get, a, get rid of something until we have something that will do exactly what we're getting rid of and do it as well, if not better. We will not do that. We will not leave ourselves in a vacant position. We think our friends in the EU uh, basically are, uh, are challenged right now, and we weren't even able to help you. The first thing our administration said was, well, let's go out and see if we can get Iran. We'll lift the sanctions. I said, the most prolific terrorist in the world, you're going to give them money to do more havoc and wreak havoc around the world? Absolutely not, with my vote. And then they talked about, uh, well, let's, uh, you know, and I understand Venezuela, and then working with our friends in the Gulf and all that. Let me tell you, in the United States right now, we are at 12.4 million barrels a day. We're going to go to 13. We can go to 15 million barrels a day. We pr produced over 35 trillion cubic feet of gas last year. We were, pr we're basically exporting LNG at about 14, uh, 35 trillion cubic feet, but we're exporting on LNG 14 billion cubic feet. We're going to take that to 25 billion cubic feet to make sure that you all in the EU do not run out of the assurance that the United States will be there to help. Now, by I'm saying all of that, we're doing it cleaner than ever before. Carbon capture, sequestration, utilization, methane capturing. We have to have the horsepower of fossil, use it cleaner than anywhere in the world, and then also we have records amounts of investment that's going to go into clean technology, hydrogen, small modular reactors, all of the different things. And renewables, we're doing everything we can with renewables, but we're putting an awful lot of investment into storage so we can have it more dispatchable when we need it. Here's the difference between the United States and I see what, what's happened. For the last 10 years, 12 years I've been in the Senate, I was the governor of the state of West Virginia before, they have said, well, you gotta have carbon pricing, you gotta have a carbon tax. And I said, are you people crazy? You think I'm gonna to add to inflation by adding more cost? What we did was do it from incentives with investments. And now we're drawing attention from the whole world to come to the United States to invest. We're trying to reduce the amount of risk you're going to have and trying to mature these new technologies. So if you really want a clean environment, a cleaner environment, and geopolitical, un you know, basically some calming of geopolitical unrest that we have, you better be able to do it quicker, faster, and better than any place in the world and then share it with your friends. That's what we're going to do. Senator mentioned, um, I just want to mention for our audience who may be unaware, um, I believe that the oil and gas community in the United States contributed some $180,000 to your last campaign. I, Which isn't, I, I by hope the way, they did because I should support States. them. I'm hoping they're supporting me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a problem with that <laughs> because the bottom line is you tell me. I mean, look right now, Putin had weaponized energy. We didn't do a thing. We sat back. What else are we going to do? Our friends and all of our allies were hurting, and we couldn't come to your rescue quick enough. We're ramping up now, and we're going to do it better and quicker, and we're proud of that, and we're going to transition, but we're not removing something until we have something better. We won't do that. Prime Minister, weigh in on, on this, on the Inflation Reduction Act, because obviously right now um, the folks in Brussels are working diligently to find out some kind of response. In your mind, did this undermine the relationship? No, but, but, but first of all, we, we have for years told the U.S. you have to step up on Paris, you have to step up on climate change. Now they are doing it. 
This is basically the Inflation Reduction Act, a bit of a strange title. I would have called it differently, but I'm not a <coughs> senator in the U.S. But the legislation itself was aimed to close the gap on the Paris Climate Agreement, so let's be happy about it. But then there are, I believe, unintended consequences, and we are extensively uh, in talks with the U.S., uh, bilaterally, also through the European Union, to make sure that those unintended consequences don't uh, have the effect we are afraid they could have. And that is being done at the moment. I was myself uh, Tuesday, uh, last Tuesday uh, with President Biden. I know the European Commission is working very hard on this. I'm not really pessimistic. I think we can get somewhere where it won't hurt. Why would they, after the Second World War, support us with the Marshall Plan now to put in legislation which is hurting the European Union. I'm not sure that everybody in the US was aware that there is not a free trade agreement with Europe, uh, like they have with Mexico and, and with Canada. And of course, you would like to have preferential treatment. But this is, I think, not the big issue. The big issue, of course, is how to deal with the fact that there is not enough gas uh, here on the continent. And as the senator was saying, uh, without all the LNG exports out of the U.S. and the fact that we were able in, a, in nine months to build a huge um, LNG terminal in the Netherlands, and the second one, the Germans opening up now one every week, it seems. I see Olaf Scholz opening up <laughs> LNG terminals. It seems to be every weekend. Uh, is crucial in combination, of course, with lowering our dependency on, on fossil. Uh, and, and, our, and that can also be done, energy savings, in the short term. For the longer term, this is not a solution. For the longer term, we have to get the climate change uh, going, the energy transition, including green hydrogen, including nuclear. That will have to be part of the mix in the longer term, both uh, the green hydrogen backbone as well as nuclear in the mix. And when it was a mistake to, to scale back nuclear in Europe, in your mind. Again? It was a mistake to scale back Europe. Well, that, that is a decision. If I say that, I'm criticizing the German government. I'm not going to do that because oh, it, is a, it is a national. Exactly. I, I okay. promised her to be provocative, so, <laughs> uh, and so she's now challenging me. Uh, but um, that is a national competence, Germany. Uh, but I would not be amazed if in somewhat years in the future, I'm not sure about Germany, but many more countries will start to reinvest in nuclear. We will build. Uh, to new uh, nuclear reactors, because we do feel it has to be part of our energy mix uh, going forward. Of course, it takes years to build them. So for the shorter term, it is LNG, it is energy savings, and it is getting that energy transition going. And uh, then I'm fairly confident that we can just scrape through and deleverage our dependence on Russia, uh, which, of course, we were forced to do uh, since uh, this horrible uh, aggression started against Ukraine. Madam President, I'd love if you could weigh in at this point and talk to me a bit about the obligations that you feel the West has to the global South. And I'm talking about the need for investment and also, in a sense, payback. To your mind, where does this leave you? Because technically, this isn't your fight. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for me, I'm first looking at the sources of the crisis, and here we are talking about geopolitical and then uh, climate change. But then um, geopolitical will always be there. So I think the lesson we are learning from that, that we have to diversify sources of energy. Um, for a long time, I think Europe has been depending on well, wherever they were depending on, but then crisis happened, and now we have crisis in energy. So it's high time to look to Africa. It's high time that Africa could be another source of energy. We have everything. When we talk of green energy, Africa has got everything, has got nickel, has got cobalt, has got copper. So it's high time Europe, America, and others come and manufacture, extract from Africa, manufacture from Africa, and then leave some energy to Africa and uh, take some to their other countries. But then um, uh, I must say that um, for Africa, for us, we think we still need funding um, to get energy from gas, of course. We, we accept green energy, but there has to be transition, yeah. proper transition. And who we should foot the bill for that, in my mind? Who should foot the bill for that? Should that be developed nations? Should it be the private sector? 
private sector, private sector, because it's um, it's it's um, trade and investment. So private sector should come to Africa, extract and produce energy, but again fund for transition, fund for transition, because the reality is Africa now needs a lot, a lot of energy, because the fourth industrial revolution is concentrating in Africa. A lot of investment, a lot of manufacturing is done over there. So there is um, a high demand of energy in Africa. So I think the world should look to Africa now. But again, in Africa we have learned our lessons as well. Whatever we have, we have to concentrate in our power pools, regional power pools. East African power pools, Southern African power pools. Uh, we had that policy. We haven't done enough to, to create our power pools. So I think if we have the power pools, then there will no be problem of shortage of energy because whoever has any crisis, the power pool could serve for the, for the region. So that's the lesson I think we, we learned. But again, I think this is uh, a global problem, and the solutions should be globally. Multilateralism in solving this problem. Francesca. Because, yeah, we have seen um, panicking around the world. The superpowers, big powers, they are all coming up with their own policies for, for, for getting more energy. Americans have got their own policies, um, Europe, Japan, India. Mm -hmm. They are coming with different, different policies, but in unilateralism. So we think um, this is a global problem. The globe should solve, should have an effort, effort, global effort to solve this problem. So that's what I can say. Francesca, weigh in from the private sector point of view. You've heard from the policymakers. Does this, um, in your mind, influence your strategy going forward? Because uh, Mr. Starmer, for example, is talking about um, an OPEC-like organization that would include all of the European nations as well as the United yes. Kingdom, mm -hmm. talking about a cohesive approach. Ms. Root is saying it's time to invest in more nuclear as well. Mm -hmm. What, to your mind, does this say to the private sector? Time to invest? Yes. It's time to invest. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought this might was it. Go ahead. So, I, you know, I think... If you look at the continuous <clears throat> changes in policy making around the world, you would really stop doing anything. I mean, this would be an on-off, on-off mm -hmm. affair with very little done. So <clears throat> you have to look a little bit at the major uh, trends. And, and the major trends are very simple and basic, and they've always been around. For something to make sense, it has to be in the money it has to make economic sense. And I like very much what uh, Senator mentioned just said. You cannot substitute something if you don't have anything that substitutes it, that it's at least equal or better. So that's really the guiding principle for going long term. You have to make choices that are technologically robust in the economic sense. Second, clearly you want to avoid the climate risk uh, disaster, so you have to have that, that light guiding you because you cannot make long-term bets on this uh, disaster that, that is in front of us. And thirdly, it has to have to do, it has to do with security of supply, which was maybe a little bit in the limelight, in the back you know, of our mind a year ago. Now it's definitely in the front of a mind of many, many governments. So these three things really guide us. And if you look at what technology is doing, in, in the light of these three parameters, there's lots of things that help and lots of investments that make sense. And when you see policies that don't get it, you try and articulate some kind of response and try to convince that the policymakers and the regulators, you try again, and if it doesn't work, you go elsewhere. I mean, it's very simple. You cannot fight a government, you have to wait that the government changes, or you have to wait that their mind changes, but the world is large, and the opportunities for investments are everywhere. And, you know, if I, if I can say, you know, we've been investing in the U.S. now more than 
almost 20 years, okay? So we've seen a lot of different administrations coming and going, and we've seen a trend that has been characterized by these three things. Investments and renewables made sense because they were in the money, not because people were friendly with the environment. But you know that. You know, it's a total departing an issue. But is, uh, is this investment money. making money? Yes, it is. So let's do it. We would have been crazy to force it without that, that guiding star. So I think that's really the point for a private sector that has a long term. Of course, there are short term investments that don't require this kind of articulated uh, thinking. But in our case, unfortunately, we are on very, very long term. So we have to go through this kind of principles to, 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 to drive our strategy. Does it concern you as an industry leader to hear the comments that, from Mr. Stormer, for example, that there should be no new oil and gas investment in the North Sea? Because we're talking about the transition and every oil and gas <clears throat> energy CEO tells me regularly on CNBC that to do an orderly transition, you need to continue to invest in spare capacity and in fossil fuels. Frankly, I think it is very, very difficult to answer that question. I tell you, and, 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 and I know many of my colleagues in the oil and gas business, and I respect what they're doing because it's very, very difficult to, to transition. The transition is much faster than originally estimated, yeah. and it's going to accelerate. So the decisions in that field risk to be wrong or right very quickly, and that is a little bit contrary to this industry track record. This is an industry track record that goes in decades. But then here, we're talking about years. Think what happened to the gas business in Europe after the war. All of a sudden, we have a, a seismic change, and we discover that we could use a lot less gas, not only because it's warm outside, but because we are all of a sudden understanding how much we were wasting of it. Yeah. So, so I think in that case, I would be kind of careful mm. not to make bets that go too long in the future, because the future is coming fast. Yeah. Ilham, what's the greatest danger in your mind um, as we move forward with the energy transition? Policymakers clearly got a lot of things wrong ahead of this horrific invasion of Ukraine, and we're seeing that all playing out now in real time, and over the last 12 months the same. To your mind, what does Brussels need to learn from this? from a policy perspective? Um, well, a lot has been said. I represent the, the chemical industry here. Uh, it's the mother of all industries. Uh, for Brussels and Europe, we are the fourth largest industry in Europe, right? The oldest one and the mother of all industries. Basically, without chemistry, there is no EV battery, there is no green hydrogen, there is no semiconductors. And it's one of the oldest one, 100 years of infrastructure. So. Um, in Europe, Europe is one of the most, is the most regulated region in the world. We have the Green Deal, we have the Fit for 55, which many corporations like ours have adopted. Um, and there is a cost of decarbonization for the existing infrastructure. Let's not forget the old infrastructure. For a company like Solvay, it represents 20% of our annual revenues, right? It has a cost. We can do it, we are a large company, we believe in it, but there are SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, we need also, there are our customers, there are our suppliers, we need to embark. So the challenge, and then there is the green field, right? The green you know, investments, like green hydrogen, right? Like EV batteries, <coughs> the Airbus of batteries, semiconductors to get our sovereignty, rare earths, we didn't talk about it. 90% of the magnet, they come from China these days, right? We are in a rare earth value chain and we need to localize and onshore the rare earth. And all these investments have to be subsidized as well and supported. And the last but not the least, it's just transition is how to upskill the 20 million Europeans who need to be upskilled to prepare them for the job of tomorrow. So there is one word, just one takeaway from my speech is competitiveness. Mm. Europe has a huge challenge and huge risk of deindustrialization. IRA is not the enemy, it's the best thing which could happen to Europe is mm. IRA, thank you. <laughs> because IRA, I mean, we should not get into the trap that Biden is incentivizing and Europe is over-regulating. And this is where we are today as, as an industry. So the question is not IRA or not. The question is, what does it take for Europe to have a competitive industrial 
infrastructure and policies. That's what we need. For the chemical industry, again, I need clean energy. I need it at cost, at scale, 365 days a year around our, my size. To give you an example, we committed to exit car, uh, coal by 2030. I joined the company four years ago. It took me three years to get permitting, both in Germany and France. It's insane. We were ready to pay the money. We had alliances, even subsidies. The money is not the problem. Cash is there. But the permitting and the bureaucracy is too heavy. So if there are two calls, as a European as well, Cri du Coeur is we need an industrial policy with competitiveness at the heart of it. Let's talk about an energy union, carbon pricing. We already have it as a company globally, be it in China, in the US, or in Europe. And the second one is permitting. Get it done yeah. quicker. Is that possible in your mind, Prime Minister? Yes, and it is necessary. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I really think... Because I've spent a lot of time in Brussels, so... You. You could... You could um, you I, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I'm always... Uh, yeah, but always going back to The Hague. But um, um, uh, there is... Uh, this Inflation Reduction Act, uh, I agree, um, it is also an opportunity because in Europe the discussion immediately focuses on getting rid of state aid rules that we extremely unwise. We have to tune the state aid rules uh, very specifically and targetedly but not get rid of them. Secondly, we need a big new fund of money to uh, subsidize our industries. There is Already, there are lots of funds around. We have the European budget, we have the uh, recovery uh, fund, etc. So there is money about. Uh, what we do not have is enough competitiveness. We have a debt to GDP and some of the biggest economies over 100%. We have pension systems which are really outdated and at this moment uh, taking out 10 to 15% of GDP in some of the biggest economies in Europe. And that is just, those are the things we have to, we have to uh, transform. It's crucial. Uh, my country is now investing 35 billion in the energy transition because we can make that money available uh, because we are only spending 5% of our GDP on pensions. But the most important thing, going back to the theme of this, uh, this panel, is the energy transition because there are large and big opportunities for companies for innovation if we do this in the right way. In my country, we have 10 million in employment, 10 million people employed. I predict that by 2030, one to two million will be employed in new industries, in innovative sectors, which will come out of this energy transition if we do it in the right way. Uh, and there we also have to work together at a European scale. Um, I think that's crucial, but competitiveness, including bringing down our debt to GDP in many economies, is crucial. Otherwise, uh, Europe will be the museum of the world, people coming here to look at the beautiful buildings and cities. But real stuff will happen in Asia and the US. And I cannot accept that, uh, because this is the best part of the world to live in, not only because of the Musea, but also because of our industry base and our innovative industry. Yeah. And this is where I would think of some applause from yeah. the... <laughs> <laughs> it would be helpful. Thank you. <laughs> let, let me respond, basically. The, how the IRA came about was because of the Ukraine war. Let's be honest. We knew everyone has their desires. They want everything to be clean and green. We all do. But also the real, real life sets in and, and the realization that you've got to have dispatchable 24-7 in, in the country, in all of our countries, 24-7 power dispatchable. Okay? And up until not long ago, we basically had only coal and nuclear. Then gas came on. And we did, it was controversial, but we did fracking. Fracking unleashed an ocean of energy for the United States. We were basically a net importer of energy we needed. We reversed our, our, our terminals to be exporters. We've got six terminals working now, export LNGs. We've got four more that will come online very quickly. And then we have 10 in a hopper. Maybe even half of those come. So that's where we're going to get to the 2030. So we become a net, net export. We played to our strengths. But that it, it didn't hit. It didn't hit really a nerve until we saw what Putin did to Ukraine. That's what got me going. And when we were told, and, and, and we were told, and, and, and all these high end meetings that we have, secretive meetings in, in the skiff, we call it, that if you, two things were going to happen in 2022 either Russia would you know, move on Ukraine 
or China would move on Taiwan. Those were the two things, and they gave us the scenarios. They broke it down from a military standpoint. We were told that basically Ukraine, it's not going to, if it does happen, it won't be long. Maybe a week or two, it's going to be so like Crimea, Crimea. So we had all these set aside. We were told that also inflation wasn't going to be, it's transitory. I didn't think that was true, and I told him I disagreed with him, and I didn't think that uh, Ukraine would roll over. God, they didn't. Thank God for Zelensky and Ukrainian people. When all that happened, then Putin weaponized energy. Then you also. To be fair, oh, Senator, yeah. he had been weaponizing energy for quite some time. I know he has. I know he has, but it's been more effective now. Uh, and it was effective because he was able to really put a hurting on all of our allies. Yeah. And here we are, you know, with all these resources and having developed them. That's why we did what we did. And I know right now people are saying, well, the markets, this is not protectionism. This is basically ingenuity at its best. What we're saying is, we're, and we paid for that. This is not debt financing. This was paid for by 15% corporate tax. A lot of corporations were not paying a 15% fair share tax. We put that in. I thought that was the fairest thing to do. And we paid for it. Also, we paid two, over, over $300 billion of our debt we paid down, first time in 30 years. Paid down debt, produced more energy, put more product in the market. That's why it called inflation reduction. If you put more product in the market, you should have lower prices. Senator. I feel very bad about the prices they had to pay. Had I mean, when on a spot market, you were paying some of the highest prices of gas and our LNG. That's what we've got to change. We've got to give you a stable long-term pricing at a more better, a much better price, and we, we can do that. Because so many people in Europe have accused the United States of price gouging when it comes to gas. The market, the market is what the market is. Price, you know, bottom line, we had a lot of energy. The market needed it. The world was demanding it. And that's where the market went, it's like the oil market. So they should be able to charge whatever they feel is... Well, they're basically in a market system, unless you want to put caps on everything, and you start putting caps on things, you won't have the product you need when you need it. That's the problem. So what we're talking about now, if we put more product out there, we have more LNG, there'll be more competition. You're going to be able to have, you know, you're down about $20 now in MCF. We're at about basically $6. We're used to paying three fifty dollars in MCF. You pay $60, $80 equivalent to an MCF. It was ridiculous. My heart my heart hurt for you all. But Senator, the bottom line is we can get that Senator, down. We got a question to. for you. So, you feel our pain. <laughs> you know, you're, you're widely you had pain, right? Senator, you're widely considered as a man that actually Republicans can work with when it comes to energy. Well, hopefully um, everybody can. Well, does that mean that you're going to run? My, my main thing is I don't look at Democrats and Republicans. I don't look at the party. Are you on the right or the left? I'm an American party. I want my country to be as strong as it can to help all of our allies. That gave but what us about the, your party? Are you going to run in 2024? I have no idea what I'm going to do in 2024. <laughs> I really don't. I've been at this for quite some time. But I've never been able to be pigeonholed. I've never been afraid of losing. But that's, that's the smallest price I can pay to do what I think is right. It's Mr. Starmer, bring you in on this. First of all, are you surprised that your prime minister didn't show up to Davos? Uh, Yes, I think our Prime Minister should have showed up at uh, Davos. Yes. I absolutely do. Um, and one of the things that's been, um, you know, impressed on me since I've been here is the absence of the United Kingdom. And that's why it's really important that um, I'm here and that our Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves is here as a statement of intent that should there be a change of government, and I hope there will be, um, the United Kingdom will play its part on the global stage in a way I think it probably hasn't in recent years. And so that's my opportunity to say why we're here. I do think the Prime Minister um, should be here having these discussions, having the meetings that I've been having. Um, I want to say just a little bit about the IRA because I think um, it's very easy to sort of retreat um, and to see challenge. I actually think it should be a catalyst for all of us to say, well, come on, um, there is a challenge in relation to the climate crisis. That's been there for a very long time. Um, but the Ukraine conflict has brought that into sharp focus. Um, and we need to stop seeing it as just a challenge. Say, so, well, it's actually the single biggest opportunity we've been given for a very long time to transition, to take the jobs and opportunities of the future. I do think that um, that requires a different view of the state, and this is something that will happen if we have a Labour government in the United Kingdom, because what we want is an active state that is not saying, well, look, we're going to suck it all up to the centre, not saying we're going to leave it to the private sector, 
but a state that partners with the private sector to take these opportunities. And, you know, one of the things I'd say about renewables is, look, um, we do need to drive down the price. They are, you know, cheaper. In the UK, um, renewables are nine times cheaper uh, than oil and gas. It's economic sense to press forward here to innovate uh, and make sure that, you know, an active state knocks out the barriers. There's no end of businesses that say to me, we could go faster here on the renewables, but there's bureaucracy, there's planning, there's all the things that get in the way. Um, and I think an active state says, right, we partner with that, we knock them out of the way, and we drive forward, because the prize here is huge in terms of energy security. And that shouldn't be something which is national. It's in all of our interest to have energy security. It's in all of our interest to make sure that Putin can't weaponize energy across the world, um, whether it's now or any time in the future. So that's why, you know, there's an element, um, of course, of each country trying to rise to this challenge themselves. But there is also an element of mutual cooperation in this um, in relation to the mutual threats that we are facing. And um, that's why I'm very keen to develop this idea of Clean Power Alliance, which, as I say, is an inverse OPEC in the sense that the, the purpose is to drive down those prices across the globe. When you say active state, you're not talking about nationalizing industry. No, completely um, the opposite. So if um, we do come into government... Um, what changed your through, mind? Because I know at some point in the recent past you were for nationalizing and well, we energy looked at and when we When the energy prices went through the roof in the summer, um, we had a good hard think about what... Because, you know... Consumers, families across the United Kingdom were really worried because their prices were you know, doubling, tripling, and um, there was already a cost of living crisis. And we looked at the cost of taking energy companies into public ownership and had to make a decision. Do we use such money as available to pay off the shareholders so that you can have a publicly owned asset which does nothing to drive down bills? Or do we drive down bills for people who are struggling to make ends meet? We took the second choice, having looked at those two options. Um, and I think that's the right thing. Having said that, I think an active state, we would create a vehicle, um, Great British Energy, which would be a, a vehicle to take advantage of investment in cooperation um, in renewables as we go forward. So there's a very pragmatic approach to this in the light of a very, very serious cost of living crisis. Do you feel that the United Kingdom would be in the economic hold that it's in right now had there not been a Brexit? Well, they were still part of Europe. I think that if you look at the United Kingdom, for 13 years, the Achilles heel has been failure to grow the economy. And so this predated Brexit. Brexit made um, that even harder. Um, and that's why we've been making the case for a closer economic relationship with the EU. But it's not just the EU. We've not had a strategic plan in the United Kingdom for 10 years. Um, and if you don't have a strategic plan, it's very hard to attract investment. And if you look at um, the investment, foreign direct investment into the UK, um, under the last Labour government, it was about 8%. Now it's about 4%. Uh, that is driven by the sense of instability and drift that there is at the moment. And, you know, we, we burned through three prime ministers, four chancellors and four budgets in the last 12 months. That is, that, that is not, they're not the conditions uh, for um, stability. And that's why um, it's very important that we make it clear as an incoming Labour government that stability and economic growth, restoring trust in the institutions that give that um, credibility and trust, the OBR, the Bank of England, is very, very important to the project of ensuring that uh, in that way we can match private, uh, a public uh, investment with private <coughs> investment and in that way unlock the huge potential. Really. I mean, the UK has got brilliant universities, brilliant scientists, brilliant innovation. We've got all the attributes for um, investment. We just need to create the circumstance, the environment in which we can change around what I think is the drift. And that drift is man but The fact that our Prime Minister is not here, I think, is evidence of the drift. Um, and we intend to reverse that. Francesca. I just wanted to underline one thing that <clears throat> if you uh, noticed, IEA has just published uh, a report which is called Technology Perspective Report. 
This report is a fascinating reading. It shows what happens not to the energy sector, but to the industrial sector of the world as a result of the transformation of the energy sector. And that is why the IRA is so cleverly crafted, because if you look closely at this report and you look at the IRA, you see that the U.S. have not only interpreted correctly the need to change the energy systems in a proper way, but also to change the supply chains, the industrial systems we have built in the last 20 years. And the implicit pact that we all made, that is, we want to retain the right to buy what we want, when we want, at the price we want, in the quantity we want, and somebody else takes the burden to invest in the factories, manufacture the stuff, and ship it to us. And that fantastic deal that we made implicitly, obviously, no one never negotiated a bill that, that was taken by China and, and other Asian countries, which did that, okay? They did that because we left them the right to do that. And, and I think it's a great deal to have unless you push it to extremes that are becoming dangerous. So I think it is time to act on that front. It's not just the energy field. Through energy, there is a change in the industrial systems of the world. This change is an incredible opportunity to rebalance these value chains, the supply chains of many industrial goods. That requires attention from the governments, and that requires policies. And these policies, I mean, the IRA is a great policy. Clearly, it cannot be replicated in Europe because we don't have a fiscal union in Europe, as uh, we all know. So we cannot have fiscal levers. We need to have something different. But something needs to be done because this is the future of the economic development. What to do with the value chains and the supply chains of the future industry development, the one that is triggered now, and the one that IRA is addressing, which is much larger than just the energy sector. Yeah, Prime Minister. Yes, I, I just wanted to get back to Keir Starmer's uh, point uh, of, uh, about Brexit, by the way. Uh, we shelved the idea in the European Union about access because the successful implementation of Brexit. So it has helped in the EU to <laughs> stop the debate on, on exit. Uh, but I do agree with Keir Starmer on the role of the state. I'm a free market liberal. I'm a free market liberal. But <coughs> and there is a role for the state, particularly in the energy sector, uh, where it comes to regulation. But there is another role for the state which I would like to draw our attention to, which is um, how to finance internationally these energy transitions and how to prevent energy poverty. And that has to do with the $100 billion pledge we made collectively also within the COP system and within the UN. And we decided recently to uh, ramp up our uh, contribution from 1.3 billion each year to 1.8 billion in climate financing. I think that's crucial so that also the global south and other parts of the world can fully uh, can fully uh, participate. And, and another issue, and also there the state is important, has to do with water. Because there is a water security energy nexus. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact that the Netherlands, together with Tajikistan, is organizing the International Water Conference in the UN at the end of March, where we will discuss uh, water and the role of water not only in having enough uh, and uh, of high enough quality, but also the role it has in the energy transition and in security. So, uh, uh, I invite you all to that uh, uh, UN water conference at the end of March, also on behalf of Tajikistan. Why Tajikistan? We are a low-lying delta country. Tajikistan is a sort of Switzerland with mountains, etc. So together we cover all the aspects of water. Prime Minister, do you feel a sense of responsibility for a bit of the mess that Europe has found itself in? Because we're not just talking about the invasion of Ukraine. We're talking about policies that are at times confusing, conflicting, and basically just don't work. As a general question, that's always true, but I guess you were also alluding to the fact that we have been so long depending on Russian uh, gas, uh, and there has been a, a lot of criticism lately, and I think that is right to a certain extent, and we could have deleveraged our dependence on Russian gas earlier, and we have seen this year how quickly, it, how fast this can be done uh, by, uh, indeed, uh, in the, in the, in, uh, for the short term, importing LNG. But what I do find a bit difficult is that we are all uh, banging Angela Merkel and, and, and Germany for this fact. Because we all in Europe have been benefiting from cheap Russian gas for so many years. All the European countries, not just Germany. Um, but she does bear some responsibility, no? 
Well, she was the one, together with Hollande, and I'm going to defend her here, who, after the Crimea in invasion, was able to come to the Minsk Accords, the Minsk peace process, which was crucial. Um, and Germany is a big economy, but can only do so much uh, together with France in those days. So I really I think she took the right leadership decisions at that moment. Um, but what I about do Gerhard Schroeder? Yeah, but, but Gerhard Schroeder is 2005, and what he did afterwards... Yeah, OK, but that, that, that's an internal German debate, that he was then uh, for, uh, chair of the... Uh, of the Gazprom, whatever, and, and, and that's something that his party and he himself have to cope with. But uh, Merkel cannot be held responsible for what Gerhard Schroeder did between 1998 and 2005. And, and this chairmanship of the uh, Gazprom board was from later on. Um, but in terms of the dependence on Russian gas, etc., uh, I, I, I do take the point that as a whole of Europe, we were a bit... Um, yeah, uh, sitting in our chair thinking, okay, that's nice, we have this cheap gas and it's helping us, fueling our economies. We could have done more earlier. But again, uh, this is a collective uh, thing we did uh, wrong. This is not something we can just uh, blame Germany for. Um, Madam President, I, I want to bring it back to the fact that Tanzania is on the front lines of climate change, because we're not just talking about erosion, we're talking about um, flooding, we're talking about drought. And these are all things that are happening to your country in real time. So when the prime minister discusses, we should have, we should have moved more quickly, we should have gone faster. Mm. Are you encouraged by what you've heard here at Davos in terms of the cohesion between the private sector and the public sector about the policies? Mm. Because frankly, most of the folks that I speak to in the global south mm -hmm. feel that they're being left behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Tanzania, um, we know the crisis and uh, we are affected by the climate change. And so we have decided to change our policies. I've been hearing the d discussion here. They were talking about the policies, bureaucracies, and all this. So knowing that we have to work with the private sector, to mitigate and adopt the effects of climate change, then we have to change ourselves before the climate change changes us. So we have to change our policies, we have to change our governance, we have to change the way we perceive things. And so uh, Tanzania is ready to uh, invite private sector from around the world to come and work with us, we have the resources, and definitely we have the determination yeah. to do so. Yeah. Ilham, uh, you mentioned a moment ago uh, minerals, rare earth minerals, and obviously so many of them concentrated in China. How worrying is it to you as an industry player that we may or may not see another geopolitical crisis in the South China Sea? Yeah, uh, we talk a lot about energy, but. Uh, metals and rare earths are equally important because when we talk about EV battery, battery is what? The generation of batteries we are commercializing and using to it, they are called lion, uh, lithium ion batteries. So you need lithium, cobalt, nickel, and also copper. Copper goes to a lot of our magnets, etc. So Federico said it's China has been localizing and building their value chain for decades, right? 90%, more than 90% that the magnets in the world are being exported from China. It's very difficult to have exports on rare earths. Uh, we are one of the few players who can actually separate black mass, but we need the black mass. We need the, the, the ingredients, and it comes from China, Australia. Now there are a lot of junior mining, including in the United States of America, uh, in Latin America, in Canada, s some of them in Africa. So um, that diversification and that look at the value chain is important because, um, and I was worrying when I saw the Airbus of batteries come into Europe and onshoring uh, the batteries make up, so assembling batteries, it's okay. You can assemble a battery, but you need to look at the secret source, right? The, the, the chemicals, the, the rare earths, and you need to localize those equally if you do believe that they're essential to your future. So yeah, I think Europe has started. The US definitely is, is pushing on the rare earth uh, mining. And I think it's critical and even less than rare. Huh? We, we don't talk enough about copper and other metals. So we need those diversification and that's not fall into cheap gas, Russian sole supplier syndrome. Yeah. Um, Prime Minister, just a, a quick one for you. You've just been in Washington. We talk about rare earth minerals, but we also, of course, 
talk about chips. Yes, sir. Does it bother you that the White House is trying essentially to tell you what to do when yeah, it comes to doing no, business? And they're, and they're, uh, no, and they are not. Uh, and that's why it's not bothering me. There is, um, there is an issue, not just between us and the United States and us and other countries. There is an issue around chips, semicon, uh, when you particularly talk about the high end. Uh, so the very much advanced uh, chips technology, which can be used in defense systems, uh, for example. Uh, there is an issue around keeping the industry edge uh, in the Western world, in Europe, in the US, uh, to make sure that we keep that uh, um, front position, uh, in a sense, in terms of chips production, particularly um, um, uh, at the high end. But at the same time, there is an issue around supply chain. Many chips are used in cars and refrigerators. They are fairly simple. Uh, and we should not make decisions which would lead to a situation where that type of chips will not get produced and therefore the supply chain will get clocked again, uh, as it did at the high point uh, when the economy was doing very well. Uh, so all these issues have to be taken, taken into account. We have those debates with a couple of countries uh, to make sure that we uh, take care of our essential uh, security interests. Uh, that's not just the US, also others ourselves and the Netherlands together with the US, Japan, others like Germany, France uh, is one of the big players in this industry. So it is only logical uh, that we have that discussion. But I do feel that uh, we can uh, solve this in a, in a, in a, in a grown up manner together. Grown up. <coughs> Not necessarily two, two ideas that necessarily mix. <laughs> Um, okay, Senator Manchin, just before we, we wrap things up, uh -huh. when, when you think about what happens next in the United States, I cover OPEC on a regular basis. I was in uh, Vienna when that decision was made to cut production. Today, when we look at the oil market specifically, prices, frankly, seeming to reflect that the Saudis made the right call. In your mind, is this a point where the White House needs to back off Saudi Arabia? Let me, let me just say... In, in the whole concept of what we've been talking about, energy, energy independence, if you have the ability in your country to be energy independent, you have the resources and the know-how to do it, you should do it. But you should do it in the cleanest fashion possible with responsibility to carbon emissions. That doesn't mean eliminate. That means innovate it. Okay? We've done that. That's what this bill challenges you. If you don't have that ability, then you better have a partner that you can trust that will always be there. Philosophically, that has the same love of, of the freedom uh, that you and I have and basically a democracy. That's who you should be dealing with. We let ourselves get in because of either laziness or the greed, one of the two. We found the cheapest and we didn't really care what they thought and if they agreed or lined up with us politically. And we all got ourselves into a mess. We're trying to correct that in the United States. We want to continue to be the superpower and the leader. And we can't do it without our, uh, without our European allies and natives. We can't. This is all one big family, and we've got to work together. So I've said the 117th Congress that we just came out of, the most divided Congress in over 240 years of the United States of America, it was the most divided, it was one of the most productive that we've ever seen. Why? Because we knew we had to do something. We saw the war. Are you to suggest that OPEC is holding the U.S. hostage? Oh, OPEC, we, don't, we get 8% of our fuel from OPEC. 62% of, of our heavy crude comes from our dearest trading partner, Canada, Alberta. When all this thing came to a crunch and I saw my administration, my, my government, talking about Iran and Venezuela and, and, and the, Gulf, the Gulf area, I'm thinking, nobody's talked to the North Slope. Nobody's talked to the Permian Base. Nobody's talked to Alberta. That's when I went crazy. That's when I wrote the bill. And that's when my staff, my energy chief, and my staff, we started for three months. Nobody knew we were doing it because I didn't want to go through what I'd gone through for eight months when we killed BBB. And I didn't want that type of attention. I says, they might never take this, but again, they might. And it got to the inflection point, the inflection point of where gas prices were going and, and, and basically inflation was at 9% in the United States. Gas prices were at $4, which are unheard of in the United States. And, and we were in a mess and the president's poll numbers we're here, the Democratic Party, President Poll numbers. Everybody was desperate to do something. This was the only thing that made sense, that you could do something. And we didn't know it would have this type of an effect this quick. But what, what happens when you incentivize people, when you say, listen, I'm your partner. We're going to basically share the risk. And we did that. And they jumped from all over the world. 
And now everyone says, well, that was targeted. It wasn't targeted. We want the U.K. to be as strong as it can be. It's been our dear partner. All of Europe has been, all of our allies. But do whatever you can, and if it's all about renewables, God bless you, then you should do it. We have both. We can do it all. And we have the resources. Let me tell you the critical minerals. Senator, our sorry, transportation. Have to cut you off because we only have four minutes Our transportation left. mode, very quickly, our transportation mode, we were moving I don't think in he direction. knows to be cut off. <laughs> I'm, uh, forgive me, but I have to cut you off. I just want to get our panelists um, to weigh in just before we let everyone go on what they think is the greatest challenge, frankly, to the energy transition today. Mr. Starmer. I, I think the biggest challenge is that whilst we have moved from um, climate change denial, we've got ourselves into climate change um, delay, and that's the biggest challenge. And because of Putin, because of um, everything that happened in 2022, there's a risk that we slide backwards rather than speed forward. I think that's the single biggest challenge, and that's where we need global leadership. Um, and, you know, it's very important that we have events like this here at Davos to have those discussions, to show that leadership. And um, this is my first time at Davos, and I'm told there's always a mood. Sometimes it's overly positive, sometimes it's overly negative. Um, I think this one appears sort of balanced. We know what the challenges are. There's a negativity about that, but a positivity be about uh, where we go from there. And I, I suppose my um, sense from it would be, and particularly with an eye on hopefully what might happen in the United Kingdom is this sense of dare to hope as we go forward. Prime Minister. Uh, in one sentence, um, it's getting the volume, the size of renewables uh, at such a pace that we are able to make <coughs> the trans a transition happen to in, in, a, in a balance with nuclear. I think that's possible, but that's my big worry that we can get there, solar, wind, and all the other alternatives and nuclear in the mix. President. Uh, for me, what I can say is um, whatever way the world takes, um, insisting that we have to solve this crisis with global efforts. I think everyone has a contribution to make. One who is having technology, the other one is having the resources, the other one might be having something else. So we all have to put our efforts together to solve this uh, energy crisis. Ilham? Yeah. You know, I, I have spent all my life, my professional life, in, uh, in energy. And I have to say, energy is something without a purpose. You need energy for something else than energy itself. And I think the lack of understanding of this factor is, I think, the limit of this transition. We discuss a lot about how to generate electricity with this or that technology. That is already chosen by the evolution of technology. That is not a debate we should have. I think the debate we should have is what we're using the energy for, what benefits the energy provides to society, how it should be supplied, how it should be distributed, how it should be used. That's really the demand side of energy is totally absent from the debate. And I think it's really what matters to people. You know, who cares whether you're producing with this or that technology? At the end of the day, this is just a theoretical debate. What is the purpose of all this? Why are we using energy? What, what, why are we lacking it? You know, the case of uh, many countries here. I think that's really the limit yes. of the transition, the lack of the perspective on demand. Ilham, uh, to add to all of this, for me, it's about alignment between the different key stakeholders. Um, and I'll take the example of the EU is 27 member states. They all have different energy sources. The North has been blessed with hydro, the South with solar. France believes in nuclear bit. We are agnostic to that. But we need an energy union with diversified sourcing if Europe wants really to become competitive. So that's alignment and then a really co-construction cool with the industry. We need to be in the room, not because we want to be in the room, it's just because that's our job to, to, to manage how to do it. You know, if you over-regulate and say why, how, and when, you are going to fail. And we should not plan to fail, we should plan to win. And backcasting from the Green Deal and carbon neutrality is extremely important. So that's private, public uh, alliances and partnership are critical. Senator. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to the World Economic Forum. Thanks, Hadley, for having this 
very informative, but I'm walking away uh, with much more knowledge and much more optimism and much more challenges, but also I see where success can be too, but thank you all. As we hope you all do. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.